All right, this is a lecture on metamorphic rocks and metamorphic environments. So metamorphic means change. Rocks that are subject to heat and pressure, unlike in which they were originally formed, turn into a new type of rock called metamorphic rocks. The key aspect of metamorphic rocks is they never can melt. So they're subject to heat and pressure and they do change. Minerals grow, flow structures develop in them, crystals grow. But they can never melt, even though they're subject to heat and pressure. If they were to melt, then they go back into a magma body, which then would make them igneous. So metamorphic means change. The transition of one rock into another by temperatures and or pressures, or a combination of those two things, unlike in which they were originally formed. So metamorphic, metamorphic rocks can be reduced by basically any rock. Another metamorphic rock can make a new metamorphic rock, and we'll look at that. Igneous rocks can become... Metamorphic uh, sedimentary rocks are the most common rocks to be metamorphosed. In fact, most metamorphic rocks have a parent that was a sedimentary rock. So sedimentary rocks, by far, are the most commonly metamorphosed rocks, forming a unique rock. And of course, other metamorphic rocks, as I already stated, can become a metamorphic rock. So metamorphism, it's an incremental change from low-grade metamorphism. So low-grade means low temperature but high pressure to high grade metamorphism, which means high temperature. And the difference between these rocks is that these low grade rocks have virtually no minerals that are visible in them. The high grade metamorphic rocks have actual visible minerals in them and you have a layering of some of these minerals. So during metamorphism, the rock must remain essentially a solid. They become almost like Play-Doh consistency, almost kind of like a, a, a clay consistency, a white clay but they never turn to liquid because if they became liquid, then they simply would be back into a magma form, which when it crystallized, that would be a granite. There's basically two types of metamorphism that we're gonna look at, contact and regional. So contact is known as thermal metamorphism, and regional involves subduction zones. So this kind of goes back to the second week of school where we talk about plate tectonics how this is an oceanic plate that's subducting underneath a continental plate. This continental plate is moving in this direction. The oceanic plate, being basaltic, is going to subduct and go underneath that oceanic plate. But what gets deposited on top of these oceanic plates is commonly eroded material. So first rocks are weathered, and then erosion occurs, and then erosion is going to result in deposition of shells. So these are sedimentary rocks. This shell is then going to get drug underneath with this subducting plate. And as that shell gets drugged deeper and deeper and deeper, it transforms into a new metamorphic rock. The first low grade is slate. Take that slate and bury it deeper, it becomes a rock called phyllite. Take that phyllite and turn it deeper, it turns to a rock called schist. Deeper yet, the rock turns to gneiss. If that gneiss gets to the point where it now starts to melt, it loses its metamorphism and it basically becomes a melting magma body. These magma bodies can then rise and form volcanoes such as Mount St. Helens. So this is a review of plate tectonics and this is applied plate tectonics where metamorphic rocks are actually formed in plate tectonics and this type of metamorphism we refer to as regional because it's large scale and I'll show you just how large that is. So metamorphic types there's contact this is where magma directly touches rock and changes it. And then there's regional metamorphism, which is the largest. This occurs during mountain building. It's due to subduction zones. So wherever you have a plate that's subducting underneath a continental plate, or even an ocean plate, as long as there's sedimentary material out there, that shell is going to be metamorphosed into a new metamorphic rock called slate. That slate can then be metamorphosed into phyllites. Phyllites can be metamorphosed into schist and schist into gneiss. And this is the largest scale metamorphism. We see this all along the um, eastern seaboard of the United States and the Appalachian Mountains. And we see a large belt of it extending along the Sierra Nevada Mountains in California. And that occurred during the time when an oceanic plate was subducting underneath California, dragging with its shell, and that shell was then being metamorphosed. So metamorphism plate tectonics, this is where the large scale metamorphism occurs throughout the world. 
the huge mountain belt such as the Alps, the Appalachian Mountains, the Rocky Mountains, we see a lot of metamorphic rocks associated with very large mountain ranges. Even today, the Himalayans have a large metamorphic belt associated with them. And this is because as these plates are subducting, they're carrying down with them sedimentary rock shell that is in turn being metamorphosed. So plate tectonics basically, again, this is one of those theories in geology that helped explain other theories. So it was originally thought that metamorphic rocks occurred because shells would be buried in a valley someplace. And over time that shell got buried deeper and deeper and deeper and as it did, it transformed into these various states of metamorphic rocks. And that thick accumulations of sediments from these valleys eroded from the mountains and filled in these basins and kind of compressed them downwards, creating metamorphic rocks. And that was a, a pretty much the prevailing theory until plate tectonics came along in the 1960s and off the coast of these plates, such as off the coast of Oregon and Washington, we discovered that these oceanic plates had deposits of shell material that came off of continents and along these metamorphic boundaries we see this sequence of metamorphic rocks. So again, this is a neat aspect of plate tectonics where plate tectonics then was able to answer a lot of questions such as why there was such a wide variety of metamorphic rocks from low grade metamorphic to high grade metamorphic. And so plate tectonics helped answer that. Eastern United States, so if you look at the Appalachian Mountains, and this is a, a cross section of the Appalachian Mountains, there are these long belts of metamorphic rocks that extend basically from Maine all the way down to Georgia. Long sequence of metamorphic rocks. In fact, the state of Pennsylvania is mostly consist of metamorphic rocks. A lot of slates are found in Pennsylvania. In California, these blue and these green rocks that basically go all along the start in Northern California, the Klamath Mountains, go along, along the Sierra Nevada Mountains. We find them on the east side of the Sierra Nevada Mountains, all the way down in Arizona. This used to be a large subduction zone back during the Mesozoic. And when that plate was subducting underneath California, it was carrying with it classic sedimentary rock shells that were eroding off the continent. Those shells were then subject to heat pressure and in turn turned into large belts of metamorphic rocks. Catalina Island happens to be one of those. As it turns out, if you look at the geology of all the Channel Islands, Catalina Island is unique compared to the other Channel Islands because it is mostly comprised of metamorphic rocks. The other Channel Islands, they consist of rocks that are volcanic in nature. So Catalina Island is a very unique setting. It consists of a rock called blue schist and green schist. And the theories of, of Catalina Island is that Catalina Island was a microcontinent that came from Australia. This microcontinent came across on a plate and it tried to subduct. Continental material cannot subduct, but it tried. It actually got caught in what's called an accretionary prism. It kind of got caught in between a couple different microcontinents and a lot of sediments and it was kind of compressed. So compression was the substitute for metamorphism. So one theory says that, that Catalina Island actually did subduct. It went down to a certain degree and then popped back up like a cork because it was just too buoyant to stay down. And this is how we explain the origins of metamorphic rocks, which are generally found deep. So within Catalina Island, you find a lot of rocks, what are called a phase of metamorphism, is called the schist phase. And that consists of schist rocks that are green and blue in color. And we find those rocks throughout Catalina Island, and we don't find those rocks on the other Channel Islands, such as Santa Cruz. So Santa Catalina Island, especially the uh, north end where Twin Harbors is, this entire north end is all basically comprised of blue schist. So blue schist is a fairly medium to high grade metamorphic rock that occurs at depth. So there's a lot of unanswered questions about cutting the island about this subduction aspect of it. Did it really subduct or did it simply just get buried between two plates and then later popped up a little or maybe that material was finally eroded away. And so the prevailing theories is that Catalina Island got caught in one of these subduction zones 
sedimentary rocks that are deposited on top of the ocean plates, as they're taken down, they metamorphose. And the deeper they go, they go to a higher degree of metamorphism. So in this diagram here, slate is actually low-grade metamorphism. And so is phyllite. So slate basically is a rock without no visible metals in it. Slate has a little shine to it. Quartz starts to appear. Schist has all sorts of minerals in it. Garnets often. It has the mica minerals in it, muscovite and biotite. And gneiss actually is a rock that consists of a series of high-grade minerals, amphibole, potassium felspar, higher temperature minerals. And so as we go down in the metamorphism, this is the low grade and this is the high grade. High grade basically is the high temperature and this is where you see the minerals like potassium feldspar and we'll show, I'll show you some samples of those rocks. So one of the theories is that Catalina Island kind of caught, so we know that California consists of a bunch of microcontinents that came from Australia and New Zealand. And the theories are that there are these little microcontinents occurring and Catalina Island kind of got caught in between there somehow. It got caught in the fact that the North American continent was moving to the west. The Farallon Plate was carrying portions of soon-to-be California. We're traveling to the east and all these sediments are eroding off the continent creating this what called this compressed sedimentary wedge. And that Catalina Island might have got caught in the middle of this and it was under such tremendous pressure that that pressure then resulted in the formation of the metamorphic rocks. Because Catalina Island has rocks like schist in it and gneiss, we know that Catalina Island had sedimentary rocks. And those are the types of rocks that are only found on continents. So Catalina Island is definitely part of a microcontinent. It is part of a microcontinent that broke away called uh, Rhodnia. Rhodnia broke, basically broke off from Gondwana land when Pangaea broke apart. And Rhodnia basically is a continent that broke apart. And its continental mass went to the east as North America was going towards the west. So east meets west, and this is how we get Catalina Island. These are folded metamorphic rocks. So this is a metamorphic rock that has considerable fold structures in it. And these fold structures only occur in subduction zones like this. If this was a metamorphic rock that was not in a subduction zone, a zone of compression, it would be more linear, straight. But because you have these fold structures, this basically results in a uh, rock that was formed in a subduction zone. So this is some of the blue schist that's found in Catalina Island. It's pretty rare. Green schist is also accompanied in, on the island. Within this blue schist, these red things are actually garnets. They are not gem quality garnets, but they're garnets. And garnets and blue schist is indicative of a good medium grade metamorphism to the level of schist. So we know that Catalina Island was subject to a fairly high degree of metamorphism, which makes the whole topic a little bit confusing. So there's far more questions with regards to the formation of Catalina Island than answers. So metamorphism and plate tectonics, compression, can put rocks under great pressure, and often compression and pressure can actually be a substitute for temperature so one of the theories is that the reason we find these beautiful green schist and blue schist rocks on Catalina Island is that maybe it didn't subduct very deep at all. Maybe it just did a partial subduction. And because of compression, that compression took the place of temperature. So metamorphic environments. Regional metamorphism produces the greatest quality of metamorphism. This is associated with mountain building. So on this previous slide here, uh, compressional stress at the edges of the plate. We definitely find this in mountain ranges like the Alps and the Himalayans, and certainly in the Appalachian Mountains. So we know that where these two plates meet, there's a lot of compression right here. And if Catalina Island had gotten caught up in this area here, where this plate was trying to subduct, this is where pressure could be a substitute for temperature. So maybe they didn't have to subduct that low to, re, to obtain that high degree of metamorphism. Perhaps that high degree of metamorphism occurred higher up, but 
under an environment where there's a lot of compression, due, just due to the massive weights of these continents. So metamorphic environments, we're going to look at those. We have basically two. We have the regional, which is plate tectonics. The other metamorphic environment is what we call contact metamorphism. And this is where magma comes up and actually touches rock. So this is what we call a contact. So heat is really a mo an important agent in metamorphism. Because what happens is as heat along with water, so here comes water again, very important agent, water. Water actually results in the recrystallization of minerals. So in this shell, there's clay minerals. When these clay minerals are put under heat and pressure, these clay minerals actually start to expand, they actually start to grow. And as you subject that, those clay minerals, to higher and higher temperatures, which each incremental degree of metamorphism, those clay minerals are then transformed into minerals such as feldspars, quartz, ampoule, potassium feldspar. And that's basically uh, how these minerals grow. So pressure and differential stress, right at that contact, there is an extreme amount of pressure. And so metamorphism increases with depth. What's called confining pressure, that means that once these rocks are buried, they can't release the pressure. They're in an enclosed environment, they're captured, they're underground, and they cannot actually release that pressure at all. And um, as we go down, this pressure gradient decreases a little bit, but the heat increases. So these rocks down here are subject to a much higher heat index. So this is the metamorphic grade. We start up with a sedimentary rock called shale. That shale is then taken down into the subduction zone, and shale is transformed into slate. Slate and shale look much alike. The difference between the two is simply that shell is a little bit more crumbly. It'll break apart. Slate is actually more compact, more solid. You can experience this if you ever take a ceramics class. You take clay and you make a pot. As that clay pot dries, it's pretty brittle. Once, though, you put that clay pot that's now dried into a kiln and you fire it, when it comes out of the kiln, it's more solid. It's more fused together because that's exactly what it is. It's fused. A, basically, the clay minerals are more fused, and that's the same thing that happens with the slate. So basically, if you take a ceramics class, you're taking shell, which is the clay that you bought, and you're transforming that clay into slate. Now, slate, when it is heated, goes deeper, it becomes a rock called phyllite, and phyllite has a shine to it, and that's because quartz minerals start to appear. Slate is dull because it has no visible minerals. Phyllite, as it goes deeper, it becomes schist, and schist is mid-grade metamorphism, and schist actually has visible minerals in it. Those minerals are in phyllite, and they're in slate, but they're microscopic. So at this point, the minerals start to expand, they start to grow. Thermal waters go through these rocks. So water is a really important agent. Water aids in the growth of crystals. It basically helps move the ions around, and it actually aids in the growth of crystals. By the time you get down to a nice, a nice basic rock that's all crystalline, it looks much like a granite. The only primary difference between a gneiss and a granite, they'll often have the same minerals, but a gneiss has those minerals in nice distinct bands or layers where granite is all mixed up, because granite was molten. And so this is the metamorphic grade. I definitely want you to know this for the quiz, that slate is low grade, nice is high grade, and this is the metamorphic grade. So slates are nice. Microelements, compounds, elements like potassium, iron, silica, oxygen, these are going to start to grow under heat and pressure and actually start to form crystalline structures. So this is a slate which has no visible minerals in it. It's a very dark rock. I should have picked a lighter one. And this is a gneiss. What's in this gneiss is in this slate. 
This slato has microscopic organisms, microscopic minerals, not organisms, minerals. This is not biology, thank God. This is microscopic minerals, and these microscopic minerals then expand under heat and pressure. And they actually start to segregate themselves out chemically. So these are iron-rich minerals. This is a mineral which is very rich in iron called ampopole or hornblende. This is a potassium aluminum mineral. And so these minerals start to segregate themselves out based on chemistry. And you see they get this banding where you have a layer of the potassium feldspar, a layer of the iron-rich ampopole, another layer of the quartz aluminum-rich potassium feldspar, and so forth. And you get this banding layer of this. Unlike granites, granites will have the same minerals, but granites is all mixed up. And that's because granite was liquid. This rock never became liquid. If it did become liquid, it wouldn't look like this, and it would not be a metamorphic rock. So water is really important. Chemically active fluids, water can be slightly acidic. It also can create gases, a lot of water vapor. It enhances the migrations of ions, and it actually aids in the recrystallization of existing microscopic minerals into minerals that are visible to the human eye. So clay minerals and shells are converted to potassium feldspar, ampoule, and those types of minerals. So contact metamorphism is different than regional. Regional is large scale, so the entire eastern seaboard of the United States, the entire length of the state of California is what we call regional. Contact occurs in a very small area, such as a hill or a mountain. And this is when a magma body comes up and intrudes into existing rock. That magma body, which is liquid, which is hot, eats its way into that rock. And that rock that it doesn't eat away at, that it makes contact with, it actually bakes that rock. It turns up the heat on it, and it transforms that rock into a new rock. So this is a, a magma body that came into an existing layer of sedimentary rocks. So these are sedimentary rocks consisting of shell right here, some sandstone. This is limestone right here, another shell and limestone. This is that igneous rock that came in and intruded. And in this blue area right here, this is what's called the bake zone. So I like to use the word bake zone. There are other fancier terms that... Uh, describe that zone. And so what this bake zone is, this is going to take and transform the existing rocks into a new rock. So for example, this block looking rock here that's white in color is limestone rock, which is made out of calcium carbonate. In this bake zone, it's no longer limestone. It now becomes a new rock called marble. So shell, which is this rock here, it's baked in this area, it's going to form a slate. So the shell is going to form a slate, the limestone is going to form a marble. The sandstone, the quartz grains are going to fuse together and they're going to grow larger quartz crystals. This sandstone in this baked zone is going to form a new metamorphic rock called a quartzite. So as you see, here's three metamorphic rocks. Marble, slate, and quartzite. All three of those metamorphic rocks have a parent rock that was a sedimentary rock. So the slate's parent is shell. The marble's parent is limestone. And the quartzite's parent is sandstone. Now a sandstone can never form a marble because a sandstone is comprised of quartz, a marble is comprised of calcium carbonate, so the chemistries can never interchange like that. And that's the way that it's done. So we can't uh, cross chemistry lines. So metamorphic rocks are very important in mineral wealth. Sierra Nevada gold deposits, a lot of volcanic sedimentary rocks. So Calico Ghost Town out near Barstow, it's a silver mining town. The hills around those were subject to thermal waters that were produced by volcanoes. Those thermal waters actually slightly metamorphosed the rocks around Calico. And in that metamorphic process some, sometimes, Precious metals such as gold, silver, platinum, copper are brought up in that process. So that's how the Calico silver mining camp started. Somebody discovered that those rocks were altered and at a close investigation they discovered silver in those rocks and that then opened up the mining operation. So these are some of the rocks at Calico. 
If you ever visit that, you'll see a variety of colors, some blue, some green, some oranges. These are rocks that are sedimentary that have been subject to heat and pressure through contact metamorphism. And in that process, not only the rocks metamorphosed, but they were also enriched with silver. So California has lots of geographical belts, geographical slash geological belts. We have our coastal ranges. We have the Great Valley, which is the San Joaquin Valley, the agriculture heart of California. This great big block of granite called the Sierra Nevada Mountains. And along these peripheral edges of these different boundaries, we often find a lot of metamorphic rocks. Out here in the Mojave Desert, there's been a lot of volcanic activity in this area. A lot of the volcanic activity brought up very hot thermal waters. Those hot thermal waters metamorphosed some of the rocks, creating ore deposits. A lot of mining operations out here in the Mojave Desert. So California is a very rich state with regards to mineral wealth. And a lot of that mineral wealth is directly attributed to metamorphism. So if it hadn't been for the fact that we had subducting plate and we had this old plate melt underneath the North American continent, underneath California, and create volcanoes and plutonic rocks like the Sierra Nevada Mountains, California would be a poor state. But it's a very rich state mineral-wise because of all these different geographical boundaries. So metamorphic environments. So hydrothermal metamorphism. Hydrothermal, water, and hot. So basically hydrothermal is one of these fancy words meaning hot water. So hydrothermal metamorphism, chemically get alteration caused when hot, iron-rich fluids called hydrothermal solutions. Sometimes these solutions are slightly acidic and they actually bring in a lot of mineral wealth. There's different metamorphic zones. So these are the metamorphic zones. So slate, phyllite, schist, and gneiss. These are the different metamorphic zones. And I've got a noisy cat here that I'm going to put in the back room here in a minute. I'm babysitting cats. Don't ever do that. And A, within these metamorphic zones, there are index minerals. And so for a good example, the index mineral for a phyllite is quartz. The index mineral for a schist is garnets. The index mineral for a gneiss is potassium, feldspar, and amphibole. So these are minerals that occur at certain grades of metamorphism. So when we talk about the metamorphic grade, and the book talks about metamorphic grade, this is it right here. Slate, phyllite, schist, and gneiss. This is metamorphic grade. So chemical active fluids, they get into the pore spaces of rock, and they really recrystallize. So you have to realize, a shell has a certain amount of porosity to it. It allows fluids to penetrate into that shell. Those hot fluids carry with them minerals, and that hot thermal water recrystallizes the clay minerals and starts those crystals growing. And this is why we see visible minerals in nice and schist, and we don't find the visible minerals quite in the slate because it hadn't reached high enough temperature. So the importance of the parent rock is really a key component here. So as I stated, limestone is going to form marble. Sandstones are going to form quartzites. And it's because a marble consists of calcite, and so does a limestone. So the calcite chemistry is carried over. The same with the sandstone, which is rich in quartz. It becomes a very rich rock in quartz called quartzite because it started with quartz. So whatever you start with, that's what you end up with. So if you start with a calcite-based rock, you're going to wind up with a calcite-based rock. If you start with a quartz-based rock, you're going to wind up with a quartz-based rock. So the parent is really important. And the index minerals, we've already talked about that. So muscovite is very common in the phyllite along with quartz. Uh, biotite, garnets are common in schist. Potassium, feldspar, amphibole are common in gneiss. So as it turns out, if you start out with clay minerals in a shell, you're going to form slate, phyllite, schist, or gneiss. And that's all dependent on how high the temperature is obtained. So in other words, if the rock only goes to the phyllite phase, and that's as deep as it goes, 
and it crystallizes after that and the metamorphism stops, then that's as far as that rock can go. You're never going to take a shell and turn it into a marble. You're never take, you'll never take a shell and turn it into a quartzite. And it's all based on chemistry. So there's clay minerals. The clay minerals are always going to form slates, phyllites, schist, or gneiss. Carbonate minerals are always going to form marbles. Quartz-rich minerals are always going to form quartzites. So metamorphic environments. So burial is really important. The deeper you're buried, the deeper you go, the higher the geothermal gradient. So geothermal means hotter as you go deeper. So as we go deeper into the crust, it becomes warmer. And this is when you get the appearance or you see those minerals crystallized. You're never going to see low temperature minerals in an ice. And you're going to, never going to see the high temperature minerals in a slate. It's all dependent on temperature. So slates are always going to consist of clay minerals. Phyllites are going to consist of muscovite and quartz. Schist is going to have garnets and the biotite. And nice is always going to have ampable and potassium feldspar. It's all based on temperature. There is occasionally a very local metamorphism occurs when extraterrestrial objects such as comets impact the Earth. Those objects are hot, and when they contact the Earth, when they impact the, the sediment, they'll actually metamorphose the rock around that, and these are called impactites. There's a place in Arizona called Meteor Crater where a meteor actually impacted some sedimentary rocks. It impacted it so hard that it turned those sedimentary rocks upside down. And then that meteor, the debris, was ejected outwards, outside of the crater. Along with it, the rock that it contacted, which we call impactites. And these are rocks that are slightly metamorphosed during a meteor impact. So when we look at metamorphic rock, we look at two metamorphic textures. We look at textures that are foliated and non-foliated. The, the metamorphic rocks are foliated. I'm going to put this guy away. Okay, sorry about that. So foliation means it's an alignment of the minerals. And that foliation is an inherent characteristic of shell. So the only metamorphic rocks that have a layering to them, what we call foliation, are going to be slates, phyllites, schist, and gneiss. Those are the only rocks that have it. Why? Because that is a characteristic that was carried by the parent rock. Marble, quartzites, don't have those characteristics. They don't have foliation. So we basically break rocks up into two categories when it comes to metamorphic. Foliated and non-foliated. So foliated means layered to them. And the only ones that are foliated are slates, violets, just a nice. And that is because shell is a sedimentary rock with layers to it. And so that layering characteristic is carried over into metamorphism. So foliation, so it's a parallel alignment of the mineral grains, pebbles, uh, compositional banding, we'll see that when we look at a picture of a gneiss. And so we have different degrees of this foliation. So slates, it's almost like a cleavage where slates will have slaty foliation, phyllites will have phyllitic foliation, schist have schistos foliation, and gneiss have gneissic foliation. And so these are sheets that are very similar to that in the original parent rock, the shell, the sedimentary rock. So shell, which is sedimentary rock, is going to metamorphose to slate. Slate is going to metamorphose to phyllite. Phyllite is going to metamorphose to schist. Schist is going to metamorphose to gneiss. A gneiss can actually metamorphose into a rock that's kind of a transition between a gneiss and a granite called a migmatite. This is actually a granitic rock which actually layers to it. I actually found one of those out in the desert last time I was out there. And big hunk of it I brought back. And then if that rock becomes liquid, 
then it's going to become magma and it's no longer metamorphic. So the number one rule in metamorphism, you can never, never become liquid. Because once you become liquid, you're now igneous. And if that igneous body were to crystallize in the ground, it would form a granite. If that magma body came to the surface, it might form a rhyolite or a basalt. It depends on the composition of it. So these are slates. They used to make chalkboards out of slates, I guess, back in the day. Uh, a good pool table, a really good expensive pool table, uses slate. That's why those are very heavy to move. And the reason they use slate is it doesn't warp, it doesn't bend, it stays perfectly straight. So slates are the first grade of metamorphism. Dull rock, no visible minerals, looks a lot like its parent rock, the shell. Phyllite looks a lot like the shell, but it has a little bit of shine to it. And this is because muscovite and quartz start to appear, and it gives it a little shine look to it. It's kind of hard to see this with the quality of the projector. And then phyllite, it's going to metamorphose into schist, and this is where you start to see, start to see full ace in the middle. So it looks like a bunch of plate, plating minerals that are all together. And because this is basically medium grade metamorphism, we see minerals appear that are visible to the human eye. So these minerals aren't just making a shiny surface. You can actually identify the minerals with the unaided eye. So you can actually pick this rock up and you can see, oh, here's the biotite, here's the muscovite, and there's a garnet. So you can actually see those minerals in that particular rock. And so what occurs during this metamorphism is that because of the hot water, because of the pressure, it's aligning. So all of the iron-rich minerals are going to line themselves up. All of the quartz-rich minerals are going to start to line themselves up. It's going to form nice little plate structures, nice little layering to it. And this is because of alignment of minerals. So rocks that are of the schist phase of um, metamorphism, I know that, that sounds bad. <laughs> when you say that schist phase, you think it's something else. Uh, forms a foliation texture called schistosity. These are platy minerals, are describable with the unaided eye. You can actually see and pick out the biotite from the muscovite and from the quartz. And so this is a schist. It's a basically a bunch of platy minerals. You can actually flake some of these off with your fingernail and um, very visible. And then schist is gonna put under more heat and this is where you really get a good fusion going on. So gneiss is a good solid rock. A gneiss is just like a granite. So gneiss basically, it's the higher grade of metamorphism. You have a lot more ion migration and you have segregation of minerals and you also have more of a fusing together. This forms a good solid rock. And so gneiss, very solid rock and this is a good example of a gneiss. The difference between a gneiss and a granite is they're both solid, they're both probably equal at the same hardness, but the difference is that the gneiss is going to have banding, it's going to have a layering effect to it, where a granite, the rocks are going to be basically random. The different minerals will be all random in there. And so that's the highest grade of metamorphism. So foliated rocks, slate, very fine grain, phyllite, and I think we beat this to death. So slate to phyllite, schist, nice. All right, let's look at the non-foliated rocks. These are ones that don't have any layering to them. And the parent rock is really important here. So marble, if you put a drop of acid on marble, it fizzes. There's a mineral that does that called calcite. Calcite also fizzes like that. And so marble reacts to acid because its parent was a limestone rock that also reacts to acid. So calcite is found in limestone. Calcite is also found in marble. So the chemistry of metamorphic rocks is carried from one to the other. The chemistry never changes. So if you start out with a calcium-based mineral that transforms into a calcium-based rock like limestone, that limestone is going to form a calcium-based metamorphic rock called marble. 
And so marble tends to be very coarse crystalline, where limestone is not coarse crystalline at all. Limestone is very fine grain. You can't even see the grain structure in it. And it becomes granular because as that hot water moves through that limestone rock, that calcite is then crystallized, and those calcite crystals grow. They grow to the point where you can now see them with your own eyes. And so the parent rock of limestone or dolostone, most of calcite, and today marble is used as decorative rock because as that water moves through it, it brings in it with other minerals, it brings in some iron oxide, and it creates little flow band structures to it. And so marble is quite pretty. Well, limestone's kind of dull looking. It's a dull gray rock. People don't make countertops out of uh, limestone rock unless it's full of fossils. And even then, it kind of has a limited use because it's very subject to acid deterioration. So if you use it in a kitchen around lemons and vinegar, you'll etch holes in it. So this is a piece of marble. Its parent rock was a dull gray limestone with no crystalline structure. This rock has a crystalline structure to it. And the reason it has a crystalline structure, as those hot thermal waters moved through that, it took those calcium carbonate ions and it made them grow into a new rock called marble. Quartzite. So a good example is that quartz sandstones, when they're metamorphosed, the fine grain sand grains that make up a quartz sandstone, those sand grains are going to fuse together and they're going to form larger crystals of quartz in a new rock called quartzite. And if you think about quartzite, if the parent rock of a quartzite was a white sandstone, it's going to form a white quartzite. This parent of this particular quartzite was a hematitic sandstone that's a quartz sandstone with iron in it, and therefore it produced this nice red rock called pink or red quartzite. But its parent rock was a hematitic sandstone. So marble versus quartzite, they look a lot alike. They're both crystalline, they both have interlocking grains in them, but the primary difference between the two of them is that marble is hard. I mean, I'm sorry, marble is soft. Marble will not scratch glass, and marble will react to hydrochloric acid. Quartzite, on the other hand, is very hard, hardest of seven. It scratches glass, and it does not react to acid. So this is the two tests that you would perform if you were out in the desert, and you found a rock, and you weren't sure if it was a quartzite or a marble. If you had some diluted acid, the marble is going to react to acid. It's going to fizz. Marble will not scratch glass, or quartzite will, and quartzite will not react to hydrochloric acid. And then conglomerates. So it doesn't matter if it was a conglomerate or a metaconglomerate. Both conglomerates and branches are going to form a new metamorphic rock called metaconglomerate. So we have two sedimentary rocks, conglomerate, which consists of rounded grains. Breches consists of angular grains. You take those rocks and subject to metamorphism to heat and pressure, it doesn't matter if those grounds were nice and round or if they were angular. They're all always stretched and they're made kind of oval looking into a new metamorphic rock called metaconglomerate. So the metaconglomerate takes its name from the sedimentary rock conglomerate. Breches will do the same thing, form a new metamorphic rock called metaconglomerate. And then coal. We saw a sedimentary version of coal called bituminous coal. Bituminous coal is a dirty coal, dirty to burn. It consists of a fair amount of mercury. It also has a lot of sulfates in it, and still has plant and animal remains in, in the um, bituminous coal. We take bituminous coal, we put it under heat and pressure, and we transform that into a new form of coal called anthracite. And anthracitic coal is almost pure carbon. The sedimentary coal, which is the parent, of the anthracite coal, the bituminous coal, the sedimentary coal is rich in sulfates. It's softer and it burns not as hot. It does have carbon in it, but by the time the sedimentary coal is metamorphosed, subject to heat and pressure, 
the sulfates are driven out. And what is left is basically pure carbon. So you can practically take this high percentage of carbon coal, you burn this, this burns at a much higher temperature, and it's so rich in carbon that the theory is if you bury this hunk of coal, put it underneath heat and pressure, it would soon form a diamond, because diamonds are also made out of carbon. There's an interesting rock called basalt. So basalt is an igneous rock, so we find this on oceanic plates. Basalt, athletic texture, no visible minerals in it. Sometimes it can be vesicular, have air holes in it. If you take a basalt and you metamorphose it, it turns into a metamorphic rock called amphibolite. Where do we get this word amphibolite? Well, the reason that basaltic rocks are black is because they're comprised of chiefly of one major mineral, that mineral called amphibole, which is an iron-rich mineral that's very dark, which is why basalt is dark. So when you take basalt, which has no visible minerals in it, and you subject to metamorphism, the amphibole crystals grow. And so you find a rock that's 100% basically amphibole crystals, and this picture doesn't do it much justice. You have to look at the um, PowerPoint. The slide actually shows a little bit of a texture. This next shot shows a close-up of that rock. These are actually individual amphibole minerals that have grown during metamorphism. So basalt, which is an igneous rock, will actually metamorphose into a rock we call amphibolite. And then the last metamorphic rock that we need to talk about is talc. So talc is considered a mineral because it often does grow crystalline structures. It also is known as soapstone, which means it's the impure form, the non-crystalline form of talc. As it turns out, soapstone is the only metamorphic rock that does not have a direct parent. All the metamorphic rocks have direct parents, so a quartzite has a parent of a sandstone. A marble has a parent of a limestone. Anthracite coal has a parent of bituminous coal. Nice has the parent of a schist. Schist's parent is the phyllite. The phyllite's parent is the slate, and the slate's parent is the shale. All metamorphic rock can be traced back to a single parent, but talc does not, because it forms in different environments. It sometimes is due to hydrothermal alteration or breakdown of serpentine, which is the state rock of California. Serpentine will break down when mixed with another rock an igneous intrusive rock that's mafic in a form talc. Talc also forms when a dark igneous rock invades into a dolostone. That dolostone and that mafic intrusion come together to form a new rock called soapstone. So soapstone kind of has a history where two rocks come together to form it. So it doesn't have a single parent and it can inform in multiple ways. So it can have many dual parents that form soapstone. So soapstone is about the only metamorphic rock that doesn't have a direct parent. It has a very complex chemical formula. It's used, it's a, it's a magnesium silicate with hydroxide. It's been used in the making of soap, which is why it's called soapstone. It's also used in talcum powders, which people have put on their bodies, they put it in their shoes. And uh, it has been recently the subject of intense lawsuits because women who use this on their lower body, that talc can get inside their internal organs of their body and cause ovarian cancer, apparently. And so there's a lot of suits against uh, companies that use talc, which is a naturally occurring rock, but it does have, I guess, some adverse health effects on females. So that's the end of metamorphic rocks. What I want you to really study for the quiz is know the parents of all the rocks, because that's what the major part of the quiz will be on. So know the metamorphic grade, know the parents. So know that the parent of a marble is a limestone, that the parent of an amphibolite is a basalt. 
not the parent of a meta conglomerate, is a conglomerate, that the parent of anthracite coal is bituminous coal. And then these are all the parents here. So the nicest parent is not a shell. The parent of a nice is the schist. The parent of the schist is the phyllite and so forth. Metamorphic grade works in its increment. You cannot go from shell to nice. You cannot do that. You have to actually go through each one of these phases. So shell first has to become a slate, then a phyllite, then a schist, and then a nice. There's no skipping rank here. And the way this works is really the schist, its parent is the phyllite. The phyllite's parent is the slate and so forth. So don't make a mistake in saying that the nicest parent is the shell because it's really the great, great, great grandparent because it goes through these different phases. Another difference between contact metamorphism and regional, that regional is large scale, mountain building events, Contact is when a magma body directly touches the rock. It's also known as thermal. Understand that it's water that is hot that migrates these ions that causes these crystals to grow. Understand that Catalina Island is actually part of Australia, Antarctica. It was actually part of a microcontinent called Rhodnia. And that Catalina Island is unique because the metamorphic rocks that we find on Catalina Island are not found on the other Channel Islands at all. So Catalina Island was definitely a microcontinent, a piece of the Australian continent that actually stuck itself on the North American continent. We theorize that it was later pulled away from the North American continent due to tectonics of the San Andreas Fault stretching the landscape. We'll talk about that later on. And that's basically metamorphic rocks, which is going to end our discussions on rocks and this is the part of geology where we now start to apply what we have learned to all sorts of interesting phenomena. We're going to look at water resources and earthquakes and all the cool stuff. So study hard for the quiz and hopefully everybody will do well.